Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Susan Poser, and I'm the provost at UIC, and I want to welcome you um, to the third campus conversation of this academic year uh, entitled Mental Health and the University Student. The goal of the campus conversation series is to have faculty, students, and staff engage with each other about some of the big issues of our time going on now and affecting us all. As a, as a community dedicated to social justice and diversity, we come together to try to understand current events and talk about the issues. Today's conversation, the third this semester, is actually the second one in October, technically, so we will not be having a November conversation. The next campus conversation is on February 5th, 2019, and will feature University of Chicago professor Martha Nussbaum talking about politics and emotions. Before introducing today's topic and our presenters, I want to let you know that there will be a vigil on campus today on the quad outside this building at 3 p.m. to remember and honor the victims of the massacre at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh this past weekend. It will be a brief event, and all are welcome. Today, the topic is the mental health issues and the university student. To engage in this conversation, we have an esteemed panel of faculty and staff from UIC and from Rush University. I will briefly introduce our panelists who will each speak for only seven minutes. <laughs> and then they will engage in a panel discussion, uh, which I will moderate. There will be at least 30 minutes of Q&A at the end, and paper has been provided, paper and a little pencil, on everybody's chair so that you can write down your questions and they will be collected uh, during the panel discussion. Um, and we will utilize them beginning probably, probably around 1.30, about an hour from now. And we will adjourn at 2 p.m. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speakers today. I am doing extremely abbreviated introductions to save time, so please know that there is much, much more I could say about the credentials, expertise, and experience of each of our panelists today. This is merely just to let you know who's who. Our first speaker will be Joseph Hermes, the director of the UIC Counseling Center. Dr. Hermes is, is, uh, serves as a staff psychologist there and as a liaison to many campus units, including the Academic Center for Excellence, Campus Ministries, Campus Police, Legal Counsel, and so forth. Our sp second speaker will be Leah Goodman, visiting clinical instructor in the Department of Occupational Therapy at the UIC College of Applied Health Sciences. Dr. Goodman developed and teaches the Promoting Well-Being course at UIC, which aims to support wellness and academic success for UIC students. Her work at UIC focuses on the role of occupational therapy in supportive mental health and well-being programming for university students. Dr. Goodman was selected to serve on the Mental Health America's first ever Collegiate Mental Health Innovation Council. The next speaker after that will be Jennifer Dufacy. Am I saying that correctly? Duffesy, uh, Associate Professor of Clinical Psychiatry in the UIC College of Medicine. Dr. Duffesy is the Director also of Cognitive Behavioral Therapy Services and Research in the Adult Mood Disorders Program at UIC. She treats patients in the Mood and Anxiety Disorders Clinic while also providing training and supervision to residents and interns in cognitive behavioral therapy. Her research involves the use of technology such as the web, tablets, and smartphones to deliver interventions that overcome barriers to care and increase access to evidence-based therapies. After, after Dr. Duffesy, Kathleen Kashima will speak. She is the Senior Associate Dean of Students in the College of Medicine. She oversees this function across the, uh, she's also the Senior Associate Dean of Students and oversees this function across the College of Medicine's four regional sites. Dean Kashima has been a leader at the College of Medicine for 15 years, initially working for student and alumni affairs on the Rockford campus, and then recruited in 2006 for her role here in Chicago to lead and coordinate student services for medical students at all UI College of Medicine sites. And finally, we will hear from Mona Chattel, professor in the Department of Community Systems and Mental Health at the College of Nursing at Rush University. Dr. Chattel is an internationally recognized and frequently cited expert on inpatient mental health nursing. She conducts research on the mental health of vulnerable populations and serves as board member for several community nonprofit mental health advocacy and service organizations. So now I give you to begin uh, Dr. Joe Hermes to speak about mental health and the university student. Um. 
before you start my timing, I'm timing you, go. Um, I just want to say on behalf of the panel, there we go. Uh, thank you to uh, Provost Susan Poser for having this as a topic. Uh, it's very nice and gracious that we're really taking the time out and that you're here to listen to us and to have this conversation. We're going to present information to you fast and quick and hope we'll have a nice conversation. So on behalf of the panelists, thank you, uh, Vice uh, Provost Poser, and now you can start. Okay. I'm starting too. Okay. How do you afford it? You just push a button, I know, but which one? It's the arrow. Oh, ah, the arrow. There we go. Now I'll start. Okay. Um, I'm going to take a, uh, a long dive, uh, and, and deep but quick dive, into the data that's available. This first sort of, uh, source of data is from the National College Health Association, American College Health Association, most recent survey of uh, college students. And what you see is uh, a uh, reporting on, there, we could go really deep. What I'm going to do is cover very few things, and then we'll, we'll dive deeper as we talk. Um, but first, college students in general, what do we see? Uh, more than 60% talking about overwhelming anxiety in the last 12 months. 43% uh, or so felt so depressed at least once in the past 12 months they found it very difficult to function. 45% experienced some type of overwhelming distress that was more than average for them in the, in the previous 12 months. And uh, to talk about a very serious conversation and concern, 12% of college students are reporting seriously considering suicide in the past 12 months. So broad statements about college students in general. Now we're going to dive into what counseling centers know about college students who come to see us. Okay. This first one, I'm going to try and zoom in if I can do that. I know it's hard to see. And what you see is um, the trend is really over the past, this is over the past five years, and this is a report from clinicians who are seeing students in college counseling centers across the country. This represents somewhere around 180,000 students or so who are parts of this data source, and these are the ratings by the clinicians who are seeing them for intake coming into their counseling centers. And what we see over the past five years, which is at the bottom here, and I know it's hard to see that, um, is generally a trend of continuing increases in reports of anxiety and depression at intake, fairly steady um, representations of other issues, and these are not all of them, but fairly uh, uh, consistent ones, uh, dealing with trauma, adjustments to the environment, uh, alcohol use, mood instability, relationships is also another one you don't see on this particular slide. But generally what we're seeing is continuing increase in things like depression and anxiety. About five years ago or so there was a, a change from depression being the most common uh, presenting complaint to anxiety. Uh, and yet both are continuing on an upward trend generally speaking. Um, this is very hard to see. I'm just sorry that we haven't got a better way to present it to you. Um, I believe we'll make these available after the presentation. That's why I'm putting them here. Uh, this is really what we see from uh, students coming in and reporting again to, uh, to us at intake. And what we're generally seeing is an increase over time in the past five years. You'll see generally trends increasing around things like anxiety and depression, suicide ideation. We see that increasing and a couple slides forward. We'll see that again. Um, but in general, trends increasing in the kinds of, of concerns that students are presenting to us. Uh, so not just numbers are increasing, that is absolutely the, the case and certainly true, but of that population coming in, an increase in the reports about these issues and concerns, okay. generally speaking. Okay. Um, this shows, I'll try and get that clearer for you. Okay. Um, these are reports by the students themselves in a fairly standardized self-report measure that many, many counseling centers use, and this is collected by the uh, Center for Collegiate Mental Health data nationally. And what we see again is consistent increases, thank you, consistent increases got it? in, uh, it's hard for me to hear, uh, so I couldn't tell how loud that was, thanks. Um, around things like depression, generalized anxiety, social anxiety, 
and you see the general trend. What we're seeing coming down, uh, which is interesting, is substance use. Uh, alcohol use in particular, we're seeing less and less as an active concern presented by students. Slight increases, you don't see it here, in marijuana as being a concern. So we're seeing increases in concerns about that as a particular issue regarding substance use. Okay. Yeah, okay. Boy. I'm just pushing buttons, okay. Uh, this is a representation of, again, clinicians' ratings of students coming in for any concern the student presents with. And what you see, uh, students can then be rated for more than just one concern. Uh, and so what you see is that in general, anxiety, depression, stress, family issues are usually consistent with the top issues that we're hearing about from students who are presenting to us. Uh, and this is fairly consistent uh, across uh, counseling centers from across the country. So this is the general data set for that group. Uh, there are other pieces here. You see suicidality as a presenting concern of one of many, about 10% for students coming into the counseling center. I'll talk about our data in just a moment there. Okay. okay. Uh, I won't get zoom in on this, but just again, increasing concerns uh, over the past eight years of things like anxiety and depression uh, as they're coming in, walking in, students coming into our counseling centers. Fairly consistent trend on those. Uh, this is Healthy Minds' uh, recent data set. This is about 8,000 undergraduate students. And um, what we see is that uh, the percentage of students, uh, first-year students reporting that they were diagnosed with depression. And we see the impact on academic performance. Uh, if you notice at the bottom here, it talks about students' uh, beliefs about their success in being able to graduate or finish college. And we see this clear almost uh, by half. Uh, uh, by, by two, actually, 30% versus about 60% beliefs in that, that uh, someone who has depression believes at about a 30% rate that they can finish versus students who are not depressed. Clear impact on academic performance and retention. Okay. Uh, we're seeing clearly that more and more students coming to college have had previous treatment, and we see this walking in the door, so their expectations are the treatment's available, uh, and that we will be available to meet and to provide them with treatment. Uh, we're also seeing an increase in self-injury uh, as a presenting concern, as well as uh, serious suicidal ideation, okay? Fairly constant uh, uh, statement about uh, attempts with some slight increase, 8 to 10% of students coming into counseling centers are telling us that. Um, again, uh, self-injury, suicidal ideation, we see in the last two weeks, so very recent. How acute are these concerns? Uh, the previous slide was more of a lifetime concern. This is the last two weeks presenting to us, continued increases over the years. Uh, interestingly, the more and more uh, universities seem to be focused on concerns about students as a threat to the campus uh, and to others at the campus. What we're actually seeing in counseling centers is data suggesting that that is an active concern for students coming to see us is actually decreasing. Increasing suicidation, decreasing threat to others. Okay. Our data, UICC, uh, counseling center. This just gives you a sense of are we comparable to what I was just showing you as far as national data sets. Generally speaking, students coming into the counseling center at UIC here are fairly comparable to the data sets I was just referring to, where we see some difference, some slight difference. It's a small effect size, but some difference is in the years that you see here from 18 back to, to FY14, um, family distress. There's a fairly consistent pattern of students coming to see us have a slightly higher uh, report about family distress. We can talk about why that is. I, say, I think I have some pretty good ideas about that and thoughts. I can't see that. Does it say zero? Time. Okay. Um, the other piece I just want to uh, touch on is suicide ideation. There's a consistent trend for our students to report, on average, slightly above the national norm. It's not a statistical significance that I can test, but it's a trend that we've seen for at least the past five years. Our students coming into the counseling center about 40 to 42 percent reporting some type of suicidal ideation. Nationally, it's maybe around 36 percent. So a slight, slightly above average. Okay. There's more to tell you about, more to show you. I do want you to know and to see this. And then I'm gone. I know you're going to be mad at me. Yeah, I can't find it. Okay. We wanted you to see this and. This is coming in a few days. We've been working on this with a nice team through the Dean of Students Office, and it'll be up in a few days. We've been working on this for a while, and we're so happy to have it, and we just want you to know it's here. A lot of good data about suicide ideation, helping students with suicidal concerns. Thank you.
that's not. But are you doing master or what are you doing? Because I can see the notes, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my slide this summarizes a little bit of what Dr. Hermes was talking about when we're looking at the state of mental health on college campuses right now. What I was really focusing on as well is that we know that students are experiencing more and more distress than ever before, but 77% of them have not received mental health supports on their college campuses. There was a recent article about last week that they summarized it, in my opinion, really well, where they said that a recommendation for moving forward would be to focus on helping students to develop coping skills. So we know that students are experiencing more distress, and now universities inherit the responsibility of finding new innovative approaches to meeting changing student needs. One way that we can do that is by looking at course and curricular models. So the benefits of this are that we can reach a large number of students at one time. It's a really low cost to the university, and then there's also some income incentive when we look at what students are paying for their credits. It can reduce barriers to the utilization of services, especially when we consider the unique needs of UIC students, cultural barriers to help seeking, the fact that they're managing many different roles and routines, whether they have jobs, family members. We have non-traditional students here, and so we're looking at different ways that we can meet their needs. There's a lot of opportunities for social engagement. So we see that students have time to speak to other people. They have small class sizes where they can connect with their peers. We're also addressing needs from a skills-based perspective. And this can be a really nice complement to the services that currently exist. So we have counseling, we have the DRC, we have psychiatric services. How can we then provide a different type of support? The one that I think has, is also very strong is this idea of communicating an institutional priority of mental health and well-being. So essentially what we're saying to our students is we care so much about your mental health and well-being that we're going to give you course credit to address it. And there's a lot of potential here for improved health, for academic success, increased retention, and higher graduation rates. I created a class during my doctorate in occupational therapy called Promoting Well-Being. It's a two-credit course, 400 level. Currently, I teach three sections of the class. One of them is designated as an honors section course where they do a little bit supplemental work to receive their honors credit. And I continued my IRB now so I can continue to take pre and post measures. Some of the things that we really focus on in the class are time use and self-management, stress management, mindfulness, the impact of movement and food on our cognition and our mood on our academic performance, emotions and emotional regulation, relaxation, sleep, substance use, self-care, identity, effective communication and conflict resolution, rights and self-advocacy, healthy relationships, what that looks like, how do we get into them. Kernan says that college students represent the future leaders of our society, therefore identifying the health concerns and behaviors that impact their lives may result in approaches to health and education that have societal as well as individual impact. So when I took data initially on the pilot course that I offered last year, I did both qualitative and quantitative. And for me, the qualitative told a lot more story. There was a lot more rich data there that talked about the impact. And some of the themes that emerged were this idea of skill acquisition. So a student said, this class provided me with the knowledge regarding mental health and academic success that I never would have had. This idea of enhanced confidence and personal control, so saying I have so much more control of my life now. The prioritization of personal mental health and well-being, social and peer support, and changes in academic performance. So students would say, without this class, I definitely wouldn't be doing well in my other courses. Um, quantitative data, I did a lot of effect sizes and way more pre and post tests, but I think what kind of tells the biggest picture story is this one question of asking, compared to eight weeks ago, it was a condensed course. So instead of once a week for 16 weeks like it is now, it was twice a week for eight weeks. And so I said, compared to eight weeks ago, how do you feel about your ability to implement effective strategies to manage your physical health, emotional health, and your academic roles and responsibilities? And 90% of them felt like significantly more confident and 10% felt more confident. And I think what this really touches on and what I was trying to capture was the impact of self-efficacy and how we know that self-efficacy impacts academic performance. So I cared less about did the anxiety and symptoms of anxiety change? And more so, does a student believe that they have the capacity to handle that stress and anxiety within their context? 
So takeaway here is that we know that universities have this urgent need to address mental health and well-being for college students, and courses that introduce skills, provide students with the opportunity to learn those skills and carry them out in a daily basis while receiving feedback and course credit from an instructor can be an effective intervention moving forward. Thank you. If you have questions, please tell your students to take my class. If you're a student, please take my class. Um, it'll be offered next semester. Thank you. Okay, so, um, hi, I'm John Adafasi. I'm one of the clinical psychologists. He Is that better? Okay. Um, I'm one of the clinical psychologists here in our Mood and Anxiety Disorders Clinic and the CBT Clinic um, in, in the Department of Psychiatry. And um, so what that is is that I see a lot of our students, both from um, the undergrads as well as the graduate students and a lot of our um, medical students and others here on the campus. So um, I appreciate my previous uh, speakers who have gone over some of this information, but um, we know that a lot of these mental health problems come up at, in, when people are in college, that a lot of these conditions start before the age of 24. Oftentimes, um, depression, anxiety, um, and some of the other mental health problems are, are showing up for the first time, and so folks are trying to figure out how to deal with it. And as we've already kind of talked about some of these stats, what we also know is that folks aren't getting help, is that it's really hard for students to come in, and there's a lot of reasons for it. We know that there's stigma around getting treatment. There's privacy concerns that we see a lot of times, like, oh gosh, what if I see people I know who are in the clinic? What if I have to have one of these people as a professor someday? How would this work? Um, costs can be high, even though we do all kinds of things to try and keep it manageable. Um, difficulty scheduling and working around those schedules. And then what I tend to see a lot with our students is that there can be some rapidly changing needs, that there's some acute stressors, like big tests, big school things, relationship issues, things that happen that they need help immediately. And our system is not best set up for that. So I think that means that sometimes people aren't able to get the kind of help that they want. And so I generally think about the, sort of the approach to mental health like this. Think of yourself, you have, you're out on the ocean of life, right? You have a floaty that's out there helping you to kind of stay above the waves, right? The waves start crashing. <laughs> and so each time these waves crash, the floaty is having a little bit more trouble staying up, right? And so what happens is that each of these stressors sort of crashes over you and you're losing a little bit of air in that floaty. And so what's gonna keep, keep you up, right? And so I think about it as we've sort of got these different legs to the stool is what's holding you up. As your floaty is starting to sink, we need to figure out how to get the air back in. And so and the main ones that I tend to look at are sleep, nutrition, physical activity, and social support. And so these are the big ones. And certainly there's plenty, if we're talking about diagnosable depression, anxiety, other mental health conditions, there's plenty more than this. <laughs> Please don't take that the wrong way. But I think when we're dealing with stress and we're dealing with some of these things that just kind of come out of nowhere, crash over you, these are some of the things that you can really count on to keep you, keep you afloat during those stressors. And so one of the things that I was saying is that we know folks have trouble coming in. And we also know that students right now, um, and people in general, are pretty open to technology and the ways that it can help. And there are a lot of options out there that if you can't come in to see someone, let's try something else. And like I said, I'm a provider. I'm in no way suggesting that these things should take the place of traditional mental health care. But we do know that a lot of this stuff works really well for people and can help keep you afloat. <laughs> so um, we know with sleep, there's some really great evidence-based interventions that are available right now if you're having trouble um, with insomnia, um, falling asleep, staying asleep. Certainly check out um, Sleepio is one of them, and Shut Eye is some great um, evidence-based interventions that are um, easily available. Um, certainly there's a ton of stuff for nutrition. A couple of the big ones would be Lose It and My Fitness Pal, um, which are both excellent ways to get more information about your diet and what, what you're doing, what's working, and what isn't. Um, wearables are, of course, getting bigger and bigger. So things like Fitbits, um, Apple Watch, there's, I mean, there's so many at this point. And these can be a great way to be tracking if you're moving. 
Um, we also, there's been some great literature about how we can actually use some of the Fitbit data predicting depression because as people get more depressed, they're doing less and less. And so sometimes just the simple of like, okay, if I got 300 steps today when I'm really sad, tomorrow I'm going to work at 500 and then I'm going to work at 750 and just slowly start trying to get physical activity back into your life. Um, these wearables also offer a number of other useful things, um, tracking sleep. Although, please don't um, get too caught up in it. They are great for a general kind of overview of how you're sleeping. Um, but I have people come in who get very distressed. They're like, well, I'm not getting enough light sleep or deep sleep. Or please, please don't. <laughs> like, um, the data really doesn't support that they're that effective at differentiating the different types of sleep. And nor do we really know what that even means. Like, I need this much deep sleep. We, we don't have information like that, but they are pretty good for saying overall how much you're sleeping. And the other thing that we know is being consistent with your sleep makes a big difference. And I do think the wearables can help with tracking that to see that, hey, am I generally going to bed at the same time every day and getting up at the same time? Am I generally getting enough hours of sleep? Um, Apple Watch and some of the others also have some cool things with like um, reminding you to breathe, reminding you to stand, um, offering some options too to kind of help with some of those things that also bring us to relaxation and mindfulness. Um, Calm, Breathe, and Headspace are some of the biggest apps in this space that are all excellent. So um, when it comes to these things, try it out. Find the one you like. Somebody's going to have a voice you like better than somebody else. The music's going to appeal to you more. If you try something and you don't like it, try another one. <laughs> See if you can find something that really connects with you. Um, what we also know is that there are some cognitive behavioral therapy interventions that are available. Um, there's some great stuff out there and some great data that these can be effective. A lot of them, unfortunately, are not publicly available at this point. Um, the oldie and goodie that has a tremendous amount of empirical support is called Mood Gym. You're gonna, if you look at it, it's going to look a little bit old-fashioned, um, perhaps, but we know it's effective and it's great at teaching people basics of cognitive behavioral therapy for mood management. Um, and if you're having some questions about whether or not you might need some of these tools, UIC has done a wonderful job in providing screening um, available online at the Counseling Center website um, to see if it really, if kind of your levels of depression, stress, anxiety. So certainly check that out. Um, so overall, if you need help, please come get it. The Counseling Center or in the Psychiatry Department, I'm always happy to answer any questions. But I'd also suggest checking some of these other things out because they can be a great way to help you to stay afloat when things are getting difficult. Hi, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Kathleen Kashima. And I just have to add one more thanks um, to those students who come in to talk with us about these issues and to those of you who are classmates who tell us, those of us who work with students, about these students so we can help them. We really want to, as a, as a whole um, panelists are saying, we really want to um, connect these students with services and get them the help they need. Um, we also appreciate the students themselves, um, I don't know if any of you are in the room, who are leading efforts on wellness on campus in the colleges, and that really helps us make a difference on the mental health for students. So, um, oh, I didn't start, sorry. Oh, am I going the wrong way? Okay. All right. So, um, my portion of the presentation is really focusing on the perspective of the student and what the student's experiencing when dealing with mental health issues. So um, I just want to read this a quote. A part of what ended happening, I became a perfectionist at work and I took on way more than my mind and body probably could have handled just to cover up what was really happening with me. I didn't want anybody to see how bad, upon reflection, I was feeling or how bad I didn't want people to see how hard it was to cope, to manage. It was basically trying to get to work. The focus was to be able to survive at work. And I want to and those of you who are not in your head who, who work with students who are in this situation, this is really representative of some, unfortunately, some of the situations we're dealing with um, at school. 
So uh, I want to present, I'm presenting from the health profession student perspective, although some of these things are relevant to all students. Uh, but what we all know is the curriculum is really demanding uh, with a huge amount of content as well as patient care and completing all this in a limited amount of time. And as, as our other presenters have said, um, what are the different issues that happen? And we all can relate to this when we're running out of time or we're running late to things. We, uh, what do we do? When do we study? What happens with eating habits? What happens with sleeping habits? What happens with all the things you're supposed to do to take care of yourself? You get shortcuts. Um, high, ex high standards of performance for oneself. So um, many of these students have been at the top of their class coming here. And you come to health profession school and now you're maybe average or maybe you're not even average. So w what does that feel like? What does that mean? What do you think about yourself now? Um, nearly all are viewed by family and friends as the success. At the top of the game, um, the family's pride and joy. And then can you also imagine if you're the first in the family to be in higher education, if you're the first in the family to be in health professions, what's that pressure going to be like when you're not performing and not performing at your best? Whoops, sorry. Uh, so um, we're fortunate that uh, nationally and internationally there's been increased interest in the health of health care providers. And then I have a slide from the National Academy of Medicine, which has been one of the leaders in this effort to examine the scientific evidence of what causes clinician burnout as well as the consequences for clinicians and patients and interventions to support clinicians for well-being and resilience. And I'm not sure this is pretty small for you to see, but the, you know, the first circle is saying 400 physicians die by suicide each year, a little more than two times the general population. 24% of ICU nurses tested positive for symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. 39% of physician rates of depression, 39% um, of physicians have rates of depression. And 21 to 31% um, of primary care nurses experience emotional exhaustion. So um, this national work has uh, been, been supported by many different groups, including our own uh, University of Illinois Hospital and Health System as one of the sponsors. And I really thank Dr. Barish as well as the deans and the vice uh, chancellor's office for health affairs for being a part of this effort to address this nationally. But there is still a lot of work that needs to be done. So I'm going to share some comments from the health profession students about mental health issues. Um, this slide reflects really what they feel like, is that they don't want to stand out. They don't want to be different. They don't want to be seen as having a mental health issue. No. So there are misunderstandings about campus mental health services. Um, are there limits? I mean, there's always different reasons why maybe not to go to get the help. Um, can I even take off time for appointments? And if I take off time, who's going to know? I'm going to have to explain all this. Um, what if I get a diagnosis? What is that going to mean? And then what if I have to be, they're going to put me on medication and have me do something, then what is that going to mean for my performance? How am I going to still be able to show that I'm competent and able to do uh, clinical work? Um, concerns about accommodations, what does that mean? Is there, you know, with documentation, are all these things going to be in my record? Confidentiality, who's going to know? Who's going to know what I'm talking about? Who's going to know what's, what's happening with me? Uh, and health benefits insurance, particularly for students also who are on their family's insurance, right? Do I want my family to know I'm getting this help I need? What is that going to lead to? So um, you can see how this sets the stage or what are the various reasons um, why they're reluctant to seek help. Mental health, um, meaning that it's an illness, it's weak, um, worrying, and we talked about the embarrassment. So wait, I'm supposed to be the provider, now I'm the patient, um, being viewed as impaired and competent, negative perceptions about mental health as time-consuming, costly, we've talked about this with others. Um, fear of the repercussions, I mentioned progress, graduation, uh, advanced 
educational experiences, professional licensure, that still is an issue that the Federation State Board, at least in medicine, is trying to look at. There are still are states who ask questions about treatment and mental health issues. Employability. Um, so the culture of medicine, in the broad sense, um, has stigma, silence, and secrecy. So there's a perception, and I know this is, we're trying to change it, so the perception of the stereotypes about mental health issues, again, being impaired, not being able to practice, um, a reluctance to talk openly about mental health issues, a belief that, oh, it'll work out, the problems will disappear, and expectations and responses of healthcare systems and organizations, sometimes which have been punitive, but again, we're hoping that these, this is gonna be changing with the, with the emphasis nationally on discussing this issue. So um, what I just want to close to say is that I hope that uh, we thank you for all coming to this, and I hope we will have an engaged discussion about some of these issues. And I do want to thank um, the Health Profession Student Council as well as the Health Sciences Student Affairs Council for contributing to what I presented, and also for those of you in the audience who work with our students and help to get them the help they need. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Kudos to everyone to stick into their time. That is hard to do. <laughs> A bunch of faculty and providers together. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, my, my name is Mona Chattel again. I'm going to lean into this thing. Heck with the notes. My name is Mona Chattel from Rush University. Thank you uh, for having me here. So um, I wanted to focus on the role of faculty. We know from what Joe said and others, um, this is a serious problem. Mental health, especially anxiety and depression, is a problem uh, on our college campuses, not only undergrads, uh, but graduate students as well, and uh, maybe especially in graduate students, uh, especially in women, uh, especially in um, the sciences and health professions, but humanities too. Um, we need to be aware that it's not just Joe's responsibility or Kathleen's or Dr. Duffesey. It's all of our responsibility. We can be there for people. We can talk to them. We can listen. We can refer. We can question. I am a mental health provider. I am a nurse. But I don't think it takes that to be able to help someone to listen, to say what's going on. I notice that you're not, you know, you don't seem as present in class, or um, I haven't um, noticed you um, hanging out with other students like you used to. Uh, your grades are slipping. Your papers aren't as good. What's going on? I think it's fine. I think it's good. I think we should engage students, and we should ask them. We shouldn't just pretend like it's someone else's job or it's not a real problem. So I think it's faculty, I think staff, I think it's student affairs, but not just student affairs, it's housing, it's employee health, it's everybody. We all need to be there, and we all need to be uh, open, we need to be aware, we need to question, we need to persuade, we need to refer. So, thank you. I'm done, I'm done. And if you tweet, I'm Mona Chattel, Twitter handle, M-O-N-A-S-H-A-T-T-E-L-L, -L, and I was down here live tweeting, so feel free. Instagram, too. All right, we moved the chairs out of the way so that you could better see the, the PowerPoint. So as everybody gets set up... Um, Okay, we're going to start the questions in about 10 or 15 minutes. We'll just have a little bit of panel discussion, and then there'll be panel discussion about the, um, uh, on the questions as well. So, um, uh, so I'll, unless somebody has something in particular they want to start talking about, I'm happy to throw out the first uh, discussion point. And, you know, some of the things that, that, that have been mentioned about, where, about the anxiety and that comes from uh, people who are perfectionists or uh, relationships that are that they're having issues with, or just just anxiety about school, which you know most of us have experienced at some point. 
that, those things have been around forever. Why, why are they worse now? Why, why are they leading to the kinds of charts that, um, that Joe showed us? Uh, what is it about now that's, that's different? And I'll just let whoever wants to start. Sure. Uh, start. Um, is this on? Okay. Uh, well, accepting any comment about current political times, uh, I'll talk more generally about as a psychologist. Uh, one of the things I didn't have a chance to present to you, and by the way, thanks to every panelist that was presenting, uh, if you give someone like me more time to talk, these are the kinds of things that you hear about. So I, I really appreciate all of what we've talked about so far, and obviously then guided by your questions and our response to those. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, for me, one of the things that I didn't get to present to you is, is uh, data from the CDC, um, which shows us that uh, students in grammar school and high school are also presenting with increases in these kinds of concerns and issues. Those are the students coming to us. Uh, there is clearly uh, something about uh, the young adult stage where students do develop for the first time some very serious mental illness and concerns, but in general the levels of anxiety and depression and suicidal thoughts we see trending up in those populations as well. And guess who's coming to college? Those same populations. Um, they are students uh, who are more accustomed to seeking out and getting help and asking for it. So we're going to see more of those students coming to ask us for that assistance and more of them getting here who may not have gotten to college previously. So all of those are parts of that trending up. It's not the whole answer, but it's a part of it. Other comments on that? Why, why more now since these are anxieties people have always had at some level? Um, well, when we look at disability research, we find kind of what Joe's touching on too, that because of reduced stigma in the community as a whole, or because of greater access to mental health care in the community as a whole, more college students that weren't necessarily going to college before are now having access to higher education. And from a social justice perspective, that's an amazing thing, right? It means that they have greater access and they're here, but then what we're seeing is that they're not getting the supports to then finish. So I think that being admitted into college is, is a great thing, but then it's how can we meet their needs once they're here. Okay, um, I want to talk, ask a question about, about this issue of stigma, which a few of you um, touched on. I, is it possible to eliminate the stigma of getting treatment? In other words, that, that would be a huge change in our culture. And do you have any ideas about how to do that, uh, aside from, again, having doing this online so that nobody sees you? Um, but in terms of getting to a point where we can say, yes, I just went into the counseling center for my anxiety, and that that's just as okay as saying I just you know, went to, uh, I don't know, physical therapy to fix my wrist. These are really hard questions. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I think, you know, we could talk about health instead of mental health. So even the way, the way we um, use language, uh, you know, there is, there's a concept of whole health that, you know, if there is no mental health, there is no health. Um, so maybe even just changing how we talk about it. Um, but it, it is complicated. What do you I, I think also, like I was mentioning, some of the misunderstandings or, the, or, or some of the uh, being able people to talk more openly, I think that's what's helping with the national, in this kind of discussion, yeah. is being able to say that having mental health issues or health issues is not the same as being incompetent being impaired, and um, we have to change. I mean, it's, it is cultural. You're saying exactly what you're saying. I mean, we have to look at ways that we can have education, maybe on this campus too. The work that I know counseling does, and and others, and all of you, like by having the courses, are, are saying that mental health is important to your health as a student. Um, yeah, absolutely. What everyone is saying, but I also think events like this. <laughs> Things like that where we're out talking about this and when people show up and are clearly interested in it, and now we're all going to pass this around, right? When our, when our professors can say something to the students, when the students attend this and then talk to others, I think that's some of the way that we start to reduce stigma. Also, what I've consistently found in developing the online apps is that a lot of folks would come to us and say, I was never going to see somebody face to face. I'm not sick enough. I don't need that. That's too scary. I've had bad experiences. And then they go on the app and they're like, wait, this is gonna be therapy? Like, th these are the kinds of things I learn and this is the stuff I do? Like, huh, that's pretty cool. Like, I can see how this helps. So I think sometimes some of these lower level, kinds of less intense kinds of things too, can be a really great way of sort of a foot in the door 
It's getting people more familiar with the concepts, the ideas, the things that we know help. So then you're going out and doing them, and you're also more willing to pursue other ways of, of getting care. Mm -hmm. So, I think in part we've been um, perhaps uh, victims of our own success in addressing stigma. Uh, every time we go out to do some kind of workshop, I cringe a little bit because typically what happens is more students come to see us. We want that to happen, but the receiving end of that, and we'll talk more about that as we go on, about what is there to receive these students and what are the resources being put forward and the values being expressed by how universities are doing that. So some of what we're doing that is reducing stigma is responsible for those trends and for that tide of students coming to see us. Let's continue to do those conversations and those discussions. Let's continue to expand the idea of what is uh, mental health, what is wellness. Uh, what is good health? And that includes the kinds of things that we've touched on. The messaging about, uh, in health professions in particular, uh, there's messaging about um, is it really okay uh, to have a concern? And what are the uh, real consequences in some professions to acknowledging or being asked those kinds of questions and how you respond to those when it comes to things like licensing and other avenues that you might take as a professional? Those are levels at which we can also try to address this. Uh, and need to, and I know that there are efforts at, at those levels trying to do so and continuing to do so. Just another um, short comment, and I think as, as you talk about the health professions too, um, when we think about your roles as faculty and staff as well and the impact that that can have, so students are looking to you as examples of success within a profession or perhaps a health profession, and so not that I'm suggesting that anyone needs to disclose information that they're not comfortable disclosing, but I think being honest about your own experiences of mental health can also start to change that conversation, so I'm someone who's a young clinical faculty who's an occupational therapist and I'm very honest with my students about challenges that I face and I don't stand up in the front of the class as this like beacon of mental health that everything's you know always perfect and that can start to change the conversation as well when we are examples of people who are successful in our professions but also are experiencing challenges to our own health and mental health. I think uh, one last comment on it would be um, understanding that within uh, uh, cultural identities how mental health is understood, how mental illness is understood and addressing that as a part of the system of providing care is having professionals and having others, uh, faculty and staff as well, understand and try to appreciate from a multicultural competency perspective what it means uh, to seek out and get assistance and where those sources would be. Um, and that the more we understand that, the more we increase, and we've talked about some of those today already, increase those options, the more and more the message is uh, that this is not unusual or uh, a negative that you're pursuing this, even if it isn't culturally consistent in this moment. Thank you. Um, some of these questions are also around the, the uh, some of the, what have you already, have already answered and some around some of the other questions I was going to ask you. So one that I was going to ask you was um, uh, about the discussion that faculty can be there to help people that Mona talked about. Um, and I was going to ask, you know, how do, we, how do we train them? Do they need to be trained uh, to do that? How do we encourage that? Um, I also connected to that, got a question. Uh, faculty and staff also have mental and emotional stress, something yes. Leah was referring to, and depression. We hold a lot, this is a faculty member I suppose, we hold a lot in our classrooms and offices. In what ways can UIC support us as we work and work to best serve our students? So there's this sort of dual question of helping ourselves and helping our students. So I'll throw that one out there as well. Mona, yeah, go great, ahead. great question. I think. Um, I think campuses can, there are models that campuses could uh, adopt for training for faculty and staff. Uh, mental health first aid is one, question, persuade, refer, uh, refer QPR is another, uh, zero suicide um, is another. Uh, so there is training uh, available that I think everyone should have. Uh, and that, that, cause I do believe that faculty want to help uh, and many faculty f are not mental health nurses or psychologists or psychiatrists or OTs. Um, so uh, the training is needed. And I think that will help faculty feel more confident. Um, so there is training available. Um, as far as uh, faculty are human beings and we are, in, we are also stressed um, and anxious and depressed sometimes. And um, we have to we're a part of the campus community. Um, we have, to, I think campuses are responsible really uh, as, as workplaces, as systems, uh, to really look at the wellness of everyone, not just the students, but faculty and staff. Um, 
that could be exercise programs, nutrition, sleep, um, like, like you mentioned. Uh, there's, there's so many ways. Uh, we could look at um, workload. Um, we, I'm a department chair. I hear about that all the time. Uh, you know, really looking at what we do, how we do it. Uh, are we being as efficient as possible? Um, can we manage our stress better? Yeah, one of the big things I would recommend is um, keep talking. Make sure that you're talking to people about this, be it your colleagues, be it your friends. Use your social support. And, and what's interesting is mental health professionals, I think we're trained in this model of, of supervision, right? Like we come in, we talk about our cases with somebody. We're able to process some of the reaction that we're having to it and what's going on and what we do next. And so that's one of the ways that we as mental health providers mm -hmm. learn to manage kind of holding all of this. But we're, we're taught to do that. And I think all the faculty members and other folks who end up holding these things too aren't trained in that same way. But that's still a, a thing that you can do too. Maybe it's not traditionally supervision the way you would an, as a mental health provider, but I think talking to your colleagues, you know, um, talking to friends, talking to family members, and just kind of being aware of it, of these stressors and what it means to be carrying this stuff for people makes a really big difference. I would add uh, two or three points. Uh, one is that, um, and maybe it's a question of scale, the kinds of training that we might uh, have already touched on are being done. Uh, we go out and do training with faculty and departments and such when, when asked to do so. We can't do it all. Uh, and I think really the question that we're trying to address at one level is it's a question of scale. Uh, I, uh, with great appreciation, the chancellor has uh, recently convened a task force. Uh, I'm co-chair along with the uh, chairman for the Department of Psychiatry on the college mental health needs at UIC. One of the things that we're certainly already beginning to look at is, is this question of scale. Uh, I do think that there are programs and opportunities to continue to train faculty, staff. Our police uh, department has certainly stepped forward to try and train their officers. I, I see a uh, chief sit, uh, standing in the back uh, on dealing with mental health concerns and crises. Uh, two, uh, we've seen a, um, about a 50% increase in the number of consultations we're doing with faculty and staff over the past two years alone. I think the statement is, you're not alone. Seek out, get help to help yourself in your relationship with students when you're feeling really um, demanded upon or concerned about a student who needs help. Uh, I know that the Dean of Students Office is also seeing a significant increase in the, the uh, requests that they have for consultation uh, and such. When there are tragedies in, in uh, college departments and uh, organizations on campus, uh, asking for and responding, as we do and others, to the needs of the department and the faculty and staff uh, and the loss that they've experienced, not just the students, but the faculty and staff as well when those are the, those kinds of tragedies. Uh, having programs and others on campus to support the mental health needs of our faculty and staff, like employee assistance programs, uh, the statements that are being made by the kind of health benefits programs that are available to or health insurance packages available to staff and faculty also makes a statement about how well supported they are or aren't in regard to things like mental health care and the parity that exists for those kinds of concerns. Those are all pieces of that. Thank you. Um, I think there's a writing campaign out here because I got the exact same question worded in the exact same way from about <laughs> 10 people. So I will ask it. Um, how much does financial insecurity impact student mental health, particularly in the undergraduate and graduate student populations? Well, 10 people ask that question. It's, it's, a, it's not a good question at all. No, it's a, it's a perfect question. Um, uh, I'm thinking back to about a year or two ago when I was asked to come out and present to um, financial aid officers within Illinois. And uh, again, from the ACHA, NCHA data, and I think that the re response was somewhere around 40% or so of students talking about financial aid as a significant mental health uh, impact on them. It's certainly, as we know, a factor in students' decisions to continue or not to continue on in college. Uh, it's a significant factor. Um, what I see with yeah. my students, and perhaps this is um, coming from my lens as an OT, that I tend to look more at habits and routines and the impact that that's having. But we, when we think about that students are having three jobs, four jobs, so the amount that they're managing at one time because of, of a financial insecurity is different. I think that has a really big role on their mental health and also their academic success in general. And then also when we think about students, whether or not 
they need, for example, to reduce their course load, but because they have a scholarship or some other financial assistance that they can't take the mental health support that they need because then they're worried of the financial implications of that. So that's also kind of uh, the impact that financial insecurity can have as well. I also think it's, it's really a positive effort on campus to have the wellness center, have the food pantry, as well as the financial aid office and, and having the emergency loan situations because finances are definitely a major stress for all of our students not having money. Yes, and just so that you're aware, we have also um, had a session among all the deans about food insecurity on campus, and I think that some of them are going to be increasing um, resources uh, for students and, uh, and faculty. Um, what are some simple things we can do to handle grief, especially if you already have depression and anxiety? <laughs> and I don't know. I mean, I think one could think of grief as personal grief uh, of a personal loss. Uh, it could be a loss, a knowing about a loss, uh, uh, somebody maybe not that close to you but farther away. But then there could also be grief just with some of the things that are going on nationally, such as what went on last weekend. Um, so I answer at any level. I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab uh, at that. Um, I think sometimes in, in very practical terms, uh, when we look at the things that we can uh, realistically control and impact uh, from our, our personal sphere of influence or capacity, uh, as well as then uh, realistically um, the kinds of things that we um, uh, truly can do something about and take action and whether or not we're trying to do so or not doing so. Uh, when you do that and you get this kind of a, a box of, of four options, one of those boxes is the things that I realistically cannot control for which I am not trying to control, so I'm kind of letting go. For me, grief uh, is in that box. It's a positive uh, ex uh, uh, thing to do for health. It doesn't necessarily feel good, but it's an important piece to do. And it's a recognition uh, at a level, some, some will call it mindfulness, uh, to really uh, grieve uh, the significant loss, being able to say, uh, one of the things that I need to be able to do is to accept uh, this loss that I cannot and perhaps could not have, you know, have changed that, and now I need to sort of incorporate and take into my life uh, this real circumstance and find a place for it. Uh, and it moves us towards acceptance. Uh, and I think as a part of dealing with grief, that's an important piece of that. And to accept that and not to fight it or to somehow resist it. There are those phases to grief uh, if you take that particular model. But ultimately, it's to accept the loss and to incorporate it as an ongoing part of, of one's life and experience. Yeah, um, I'm clearly going to show my bias here in that I'm going to say, keep talking. <laughs> like, um, when you're grieving, it's okay to share that. Um, I think that can be by talking to people. I think writing and journaling oftentimes, has, there is some data that supports that can be an effective way um, of managing some of that distress too. Um, in addition to the keep talking, I would also say keep moving. Um, and that means, I mean physical activity, but I also mean moving in your life and doing the things that you do. Because I think it's really easy when we're grieving or when we're depressed that you just kind of pull back, right? Nothing sounds good, nothing feels good. It's hard to make sense of it. And what we know is that action before motivation. So you don't have to want to do it, you just have to do it. <laughs> and then it actually that motivation follows. So even when it feels like you're grieving and things are, are miserable and awful, I would say still get to class, <laughs> still make dinner, still mm -hmm. see your friends, do something. Like, even if you're like, oh man, I can't, I, you know, I normally love basketball, but the thought of going to play is, ugh, I don't care, go do it. Because <laughs> like, it really is gonna make a difference if you keep talking and if you keep moving. So I, I think those are sometimes your best options. Um, what, is, what are the effectiveness rates of mental health treatments for students? How do we measure that? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> and I have data to present, but again, given our time frames, um, one of the things that we're recently discussing at the um, National Conference for College Center Directors and my colleagues is that very question. Uh, we do have some standardized data that we're beginning to develop uh, on a national basis to take a look at effect size uh, on different treatments and on different lengths of treatment. Uh, one of the things that we do see uh, is that uh, length of treatment is one of many factors in whether or not uh, treatment is, is uh, effective. 
uh, an unfortunate trend, I hope I'm not going too far afield, an unfortunate trend that we've seen across counseling centers is as demand has increased, this is true across the country, we've resisted this as much as we can here at UIC in our counseling center to then trend down uh, the number of sessions that students can access or have. Uh, some of them, the, the, the only option they've had is to go to very short term, essentially uh, uh, intake and referral systems of care in order to just take students in and, and manage the, the demand that they've had. Uh, a part of that then is the idea that the more and more you do that, the less and less you're going to be able to truly impact and affect the care that the student needs. Uh, I think part of it is a philosophical values uh, a statement that a university makes about what's the investment it can make in providing services to students. Uh, we've heard many, many different uh, thoughts about uh, what, what additional options are besides treatment, but one of the options that we should not be moving uh, down uh, in any, uh, I think, uh, um, wholehearted way is we just keep reducing numbers of treatment uh, and sessions to students who come in just because of demand. Uh, we've tried to hold as much as possible to try and provide robust services to students. There have to be uh, limits set, but we do know that there's a dose response effect. Part of that has to do with, with duration of treatment. Um, and so uh, we, we do know that um, when we look at the data that we have for students who have had at least two or three sessions of care, uh, that we uh, compare very favorably to uh, the national samplings across the country and counseling centers of the impact and effectiveness of change that we see based on standardized data sets uh, from intake to the time that they finish uh, care with us. So we're having that impact is a very positive one and we'll continue to see that, I think, and begin uh, and continue to look at that. Are there comments about assessment of success of counseling? And I can speak to some of not necessarily specific to college students, but we do know that evidence-based interventions work yeah. Yeah. for mental health treatments. Um, specifically, I've done a lot of work with depression. Typically, when we're talking about cognitive behavioral therapy or some of the other what we call evidence-based treatments, um, we can see anywhere from a 50 to 70 percent remission rate for folks who complete a full course of treatment. Mm -hmm. So we know that these things do work, um, and we know they work generally, and that typically it shows that they also work for college students. Yeah. I think one piece of evidence is a small piece, but, a, but an important one is um, the, the population of students that come into counseling centers. We know that the rates of suicide ideation and thinking and such is, is, is higher. Uh, and so it's a slightly more acute, slightly more uh, a, a population of concern. And yet, um, the um, changes around those concerns as well as uh, suicide rates themselves of those, that population is less. Uh, so something is happening in those treatment environments that's taking a more acute, more at-risk population and yet reducing uh, outcomes in a way of some very serious concerns. So we're seeing this positive impact. And so we know that that works. We know that that's there. Um, do the mental health, do the mental issues discussed affect all races and genders to greater or lesser degrees? Does anybody want to speak on that? <laughs> yeah, um, there was a study just published, um, well, 2018, uh, in Nature Biotechnology uh, on graduate students and graduate student mental health and the mental health students of graduate students. And um, this study found that uh, primarily it was, uh, there were higher levels of depression and anxiety uh, in graduate students than in the general population, and higher levels than in undergrads. And uh, this is especially of concern for gender nonconforming grad students and trans grad students and women. Um, so I think, and it was in the 40 and 50 percent of the sample, which is a pretty large sample had significant depression and anxiety. Um. Uh, an extension of some of the data I was presenting on clinician ratings of students at intake, and this is not, not just undergraduates, but cutting across undergraduates, uh, graduates, health profession students, all of those data sets. Uh, and the general conclusion as looking at, at those data sets is that uh, students with uh, um, minority uh, cultural identities do tend to report higher rates of distress overall and in some of the specific categories that Mona was referring to. So we do see that. Um, and I think part of that is um, how then do we best respond? Uh, when I look at the um, uh, demographic data of who are the students coming to see us within the counseling center, I think we're doing a, a pretty good job when I look at that of cultural minority uh, students coming in to see us, whether that's a gender minority or racial minorities, and we're, I think, well represented there. 
Um, one could argue that we might, uh, as far as when we look at then what's the general population of those students' presence and percentages on campus, uh, one could argue, I think, that given that we see this data about increased distress for cultural, uh, cultural identity minorities, perhaps those numbers should be greater uh, if we accept that data. So I think it's for us to kind of take a look at how are we trying to address those particular populations uh, and some of the ones that, that Mona mentioned specifically. Um, this is a sort of interesting creative idea. I'm interested in your comments on it. Um, is mental health first aid a CPR-like training, something that UIC students and organizations or staff members, or I would add maybe faculty, uh, could benefit from? So could you do a sort of quick course in how to, how to deal with this? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Be delighted. <laughs> go ahead, why don't you, yeah, yeah. Why don't, go ahead. Somebody who hasn't spoken for a while. Want to say anything yeah. about this one? Yeah. No, I just want to say that's a great idea because what I mentioned when I was thanking was that it really is the community that's looking out for each other. And when we have students coming in and telling us they're concerned about a classmate, that's what really helps us to connect with that individual and find out what's going on. So I do think it's a really good idea. And that's what I was actually saying to Joe earlier about uh -huh. it, I mean, akin to CPR learning how to identify these issues and do we have any ideas about what that would look like um, I don't know how many hours of training it is but it's a sh relatively brief training um, you eight, hours. eight hours okay thank yeah. you great Yep. I mean, I think when we talk about CPR, right, we're talking about a training that takes maybe an hour or two, right, and whether something like that is possible, again, particularly at such a large university where we have so many uh, students, it's, it's... We offer one hour to four hour periods. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that there are many uh, different options, MHA being one of those, and QPR being uh, one of others that is specifically focused on suicide ideation and, and response. Uh, I think the um, part of what this task force is going to be looking at is what are all of those available resources, what are um, fundable, what are reasonable costs, and then how can we get the biggest impact for the time that people have to spend. And it's going to be a, it's going to be a range. Uh, some people will have that kind of time. Others will be much less, yeah. Okay. Else? What is the role of social media in this mental health phenomenon? I guess I'll take that. Um, you know, social media could be helpful and hurtful, um, as we know. Uh, I do work with long haul truckers, and there's um, a whole, uh, uh, there are Facebook pages dedicated to truckers with depression, uh, truckers with anxiety, uh, that truckers find really helpful. Um, truckers are an interesting population. Um, but social media is, is problematic also, uh, as we know, uh, especially for kids. Uh, I don't know, do you wanna speak? Yeah, what I've seen um, working with my students, and I talk to them a lot too about the impact of social media and, and really the idea of paying attention to how it's impacting you, right? So when you're engaging in these things, noticing how you feel before, how you feel after, and talking to students about being honest about that with themselves. But also I think we tend to focus on the negative components of it, but what I've seen also is the huge increase in conversation and connection that happens of people really being open about services, connecting to organizations, so being able to find workshops like what you're talking about, things that are shared because of Facebook group, conversations that are happening on Instagram, on Twitter, where people are being honest about the, the needs that they have related to mental health and the services that they're getting, so much so that I think it's become a lot more part of the vernacular of people talking about getting therapy, of needing help, um, in a way that I think it can really start to change stigma. So we, we can focus on the negative aspects of how it's impacting our day-to-day -day mental health, but I think if we focus on the connection and the resources and the way that that provides opportunities for people. Yeah, so the literature is very mixed about social media and its impact, because there's certainly things that suggest that when people are depressed, like depression and social media 
increase. There's some that says that it's good for you. And I think we can all point to different examples of these different things. Um, the one thing that I do consistently see, though, is that social media is a great form of avoidance. So it's a way of, say, of feeling like you're doing something when maybe you're not. <laughs> and like 15 years ago, I used to talk to people about spending too much time like watching TV, right? Just sort of like aimlessly channel flipping when you kind of didn't want to do other stuff. We don't see that much anymore because now it's like binge watching your favorite show, so that's a little different. But what we see a lot of is that aimless scrolling, right? I'm sort of making that motion. I think you all know that like how you can just get lost in social media and not really in a productive way. So not even just sort of talking about the literature, but to say, I would just be aware of it for, for yourself and for others. Are you using that sometimes as a way of, of avoiding other things and of, of feeling like you're engaging in something but not actually putting forth that real effort to engage, so. Okay. Um, one person just simply asks, are support groups present on campus for students? In other words, I guess not one-on-one -on -one counseling, but actually group group therapy, group counseling. Uh, yeah, I, I think there's maybe two parts to the question. I'll speak to um, the group therapy options that we offer the counseling center. Um, since I've been here, this is my third, my thirteenth year. When I first came into the counseling center, we had about four or five groups that we ran regularly. Uh, we're up to about 14 groups of different kinds that we're running now. Some of those are ongoing process-oriented therapy groups that don't have time limits, um, and others are more structured and time-framed around particular themes. Uh, so the answer is yes, we're offering a lot of groups. That was one of the ways in which we increased our reach and were able to sort of respond uh, in about a 40% increase in demand over the 10 or so years that I was looking at that data. Uh, we certainly didn't increase our resource by 40%, but we've managed to be more effective in the way that we're offering that. One of those is group therapy. Students sometimes have a conception that, that individual therapy is, the, uh, is what you should be getting into or looking at. And what we know is that for particular concerns, interpersonal relationship concerns, which is typically right at the top of the top five reasons students come to counseling centers uh, and struggle at college, uh, is around interpersonal relationships. And groups are actually the ideal setting in which to work on those kinds of issues. Uh, and, and so we really then look to and help students when they come to see us talk about what their needs are and what might be the best resource for them. And group is often uh, the particular advantage and the, the treatment of choice. Does anybody else want to comment on, the, on group therapy? Um, this is a question I'm not sure I understand. How does trauma-informed care function in the services UIC provides? Mona, do you know? Well, I know about yeah. trauma-informed care, informed care, but I don't know how, it, how, it, if the services here are informed. Yeah, I, I think that um, the reference may be in part in response to um, concerns around sexual assault and how sexual assault uh, is uh, dealt with and managed uh, within particular settings. Uh, trauma-informed care is really taking a look at making sure that the care isn't simply an opportunity or uh, a circumstance in which the um, particular student will stay with the students as a, as a reference point um, are simply being re-exposed over and over again to trauma by talking about it. Uh, it has to be done in a very sensitive, uh, understanding way in which that is um, metabolized, uh, taken in and worked through and then integrated into one's life experience to continue to what um, uh, Jennifer referred to as continuing to live life, uh, to not be stopped or stalled inordinately by a decision that someone else made uh, to assault you uh, or to do something to you um, and to help you continue your survivorship in a way that is sensitive and responsive to the trauma that you've experienced, to recognize it, uh, to be sensitive around treatment uh, regarding it, and also appreciate the trauma itself changes brain chemistry, changes the way in which perception can be uh, understood. Um, we saw some of that uh, controversy in, uh, in the uh, Supreme Court justice um, selection process around memory and what happens when uh, someone is sexually traumatized. Uh, so that is part of what I think is referencing that question about trauma-informed care. Yeah. It's certainly a perspective that, that we utilize in psychiatry yeah. and yeah. I believe the yeah. counseling center as well. Um, Dr. Goodman's class sounds great, but I believe <laughs> <laughs> that many of the aspects can be incorporated into all courses. How do you suggest faculty do this? 
Yeah, I think that, that that's a really great point. Um, I think both things are really important is the when we talk about the idea of universal design and we think about how are we structuring our classes, how are we making our syllabi, when things are due, how we talk to our students. So really thinking about all those things in the way that we structure our courses. So it's curricular changes, not just telling your students to take a separate class. Um, you know, as faculty, we don't all sit together in a room and plan when we're gonna give exams to our students to be the most conducive to their mental health, right? So how can we think about all those things and start conversations with our students, um, whether we have extra credit assignments or we bring in guest speakers or workshops, whatever it is that start to start these conversations within our classes and maybe tie them back to the topics that we're teaching individually as well. Anybody else want to make suggestions for how faculty could incorporate some of this into their courses? Um, I think part of uh, when we talk about training is uh, part of that training could include uh, exposing and uh, providing these kinds of suggestions uh, in the other kinds of training that we would offer. I think that would be a way to spread that more, more broadly. I just want to say in the new curriculum in the College of Medicine, there is a wellness theme in it. Mm -hmm. So I think more um, health professions probably are starting to look at this and making it not just one course, but a theme in the yeah. curriculum. As you say that, too, something that comes to my mind is the idea of, I mean, it's really individual to what you're teaching, but things like case studies or, right, like incorporating people who are experiencing mental health challenges who might represent the needs of our students into other things that we're doing in our class. So even if you're teaching something that's unrelated, not that anything's unrelated, to mental health, having people that represent what your students might be experiencing within the context of your coursework. Um, we, there are a lot of questions up here that get to the, the point that um, we have so many students who want services and our counseling center is very stretched. Uh, we've talked a little bit about that. And so th there's a kind of general question of, you know, what are we going to do about this and, and how are we going to do it? And of course, um, Joe mentioned the fact that there is now a committee looking into exactly that question, um, among others. Um, but I wonder if any of the rest of you have a comment on that, uh, suggestions for that, because um, again, it's, it's a resources issue. Um, and what I'm sitting up here wondering is whether there's some kind of a, a, a notion that we really need to rethink the whole way we think about our students and the curriculum and what it is they need in order to graduate uh, and be successful you know, members of society in careers and, 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 and civic life and so on. So I just wonder if anybody wants to comment on that because the resources I think will always be stretched. Um, it's almost impossible to offer everything that our students need just ourselves. Um, we are primarily an educational institution and so it's very challenging to balance all of these things. So I just wonder about your comments about that. Well, I think this is a great point for um, apps. <laughs> like, um, and we've been working with the medical school and developing um, an online intervention specifically for the medical students and the, the issues that, that they face. Um, and I th certainly think making resources like that available to different student populations, um, particularly if it can address some of the, the general concerns that might be more specific to those populations. Um, and again, I'm not suggesting we replace our therapists with robots or anything like that, but it's a, it's a good, it, it serves some people who wouldn't get services otherwise. It reduces some of the stress and the load on the services that we do have available. Um, so I think that's certainly one possibility. Other ideas? Uh, yeah. Something I've been thinking a lot about is the role of students themselves. So recognizing students as the expert of their own experiences and that they understand what they need more than we understand what they need. So how can we support students to be leaders and make changes within their own communities, right? So I'm not, I've been percolating on this a lot, so I'm not, I don't have the answer of what it looks like, but how do we train students to think about these things, to be leaders in these areas, to develop solutions to their own needs, and so that up here we're not the only people that are creating those needs, but students themselves are developing the solutions to their problems. Or not problems, but. Yeah, I think we, we've talked a little bit before about skill development, and I know um, we have an upcoming annual meeting in the co uh, colleges of medical schools, and resilience and, co and coping are really big things. Grit, uh, Angela Duckworth's work, uh, looking at it rather than um, kind of 
following up when a problem happens, looking at learning skills that will prevent those problems from happening. Um, I, I'd like to challenge us to, to, to rethink perhaps how we consider and what are the values that we consider in thinking about mental health and wellness and well-being and health. Uh, uh, Susan, you mentioned that we are, after all, an institution of higher education. Uh, I think the implication is there are limits to what we can do. That was mentioned. I want us to maybe for a moment consider uh, a slightly different tact. Um, this was uh, offered by a colleague at a recent uh, meeting that I was at, uh, which is um, if we really conceptualize health and mental health as a much broader concept, not just a, a pathologizing sort of perspective and a stigma-producing one, but more broadly. Uh, are we, in fact, at colleges and universities maybe reading, needing to rethink uh, what our purpose is and who we are? Uh, we are clearly degree-granting institutions. And then we have students who have mental health needs as a way to try and support them in that process. I'm wondering if we flip that equation over and consider, if we start to think about it as, are we not in some way a mental health or a health system to which these students come to us and in addition to the care that they receive, to the support that they get, to the place that we know it's a protective environment as well as a stressful one, that in addition to all of what they get here to impact their health and well-being, we also grant them degrees. And that's something that we do in addition to the health that we provide and the environment that we provide for them. And if we just consider from that perspective for a moment, what might we revalue or think about and what is the value of our institution with regard to meeting those needs. Okay. Good for thought. Uh, okay, last word, last word down the row. Kathleen, do you want to go ahead and say uh, we just have a couple minutes left, so we'll... No, just that I, I, again, kind of emphasize what other people have said, we need to continue the conversation. We need to figure out and work collaboratively with our students and talk about these issues and figure out how we can best work as a community together so that we have a healthy UIC. I agree with everything that's been said here, and I'm, I'm so glad to see so many people here and so many people that are interested in this and trying to get information and to make this visible. So thank you for being here. Um, yeah, and, and also connect with, with us, with each other. Um, start, start talking about it more, and, and you have so many ideas too, so tell us what you're thinking and initiatives you might have ideas for and communities you might want to build. Yeah, um, and just ditto. Uh, and just um, ensuring that students are really active participants in whatever process we have or you have. Thank you. And it's worth mentioning that this has been uh, streamed, but it's also videotaped. And so we will, I don't know, do we say videotaped anymore? I don't know. Uh, but whatever it is, it will be up on my, uh, it will be up on my website, which is just uh, provost.uic.edu. And to the extent that we can have permission to take the slides uh, from the panelists, we will also put the slides up there and separately so that you can uh, read them clearly. So please join me in thanking our panelists for today. Thank you.